Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, where we're determined to win Village of the Year every year until we've watched 100 of the greatest movies of all time. I'm Clint Gage, and joining me, as always, Cinefix's Neighborhood Watch Liaison PC, Alex Stedman. Alex, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Clint? I'm doing all right, doing all right. And also yeah. here, as always, the greater good himself, Michael Calabro. Cal, what's happening, hey, dude? How's it going, Clint? Just trying to clean up the town, you know? Do my part. Aren't we all? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, if we can just get this, you know what? I, I started to make a joke, but honestly, I'm already laughing at the movie that we're about to talk about today. It's, <laughs> it's I just a real thought fun about, movie. I just thought about the living statue and I just started chuckling again. I was going to make a living uh, statue reference, but I can't Clint, those because were great, the one in the movie I, I was, is funny enough. I was going to, I was hoping you would call one of us a uh, P.I. Staker. Oh yeah. P, piss Taker. <laughs> piss that's, taker, yeah. uh, <laughs> God, that's so good. Um, well, listen, I mean, the community season is is rolling right along here, season two uh, of the top 100, and Dan's algorithm is, it's back on its broken clock routine because, uh, you know, this week we actually have a thematically relevant community movie to talk about, I think, in Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz, which, as we've already said, uh, it's such a funny movie. It's just, it's this is going to be another one that I'm going to have a hard time talking about. Because I most of the, most of my moments are just like you remember when this happened, man, that was funny. Well, <laughs> you know? So I'm gonna do it, my best to not do that, but I, I'm gonna apologize in advance for it anyway. It also reads to me as a movie that they had a lot of fun making, and everything I read about it just sounds like they were just having a ball. Because I remember I, I was even I was looking up what the title means. And I don't know why it didn't occur to me that the title means absolutely yeah. nothing. Yeah. Like, I think there's an interview where Simon Pegg is like, or not Simon Pegg, uh, Ed Edgar Wright's like, yeah, that's cop movies. You take an adjective and a noun yeah. and you smush them together and you got a title. Like, everything I, about it is just fun and funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I stumbled across a handful of things that that came out of the uh, their audio commentary tracks for the movie because it, it you know it came out in two thousand seven. It did pretty well on you know it, it made eighty something million dollars uh, in its theatrical release, but it did just as well almost on on DVD. Like it's another one of these movies that the home video market did incredibly well for it, and it kind of cemented uh, you know oh. it being a super popular movie. Oh yeah, I mean plus like Edgar Wright is like that like director that has a ton of fanboys and this would have came like right at the peak of physical media so it's just like this was yeah. this was a must own dvd well this was a this was well, a and, high time for him too yeah. and there were like three different dvds like later that year uh, a three disc set came out or something like that so there's like half a dozen different audio commentary tracks from edgar wright there's even one that i found that we, and we'll talk about about it more a little bit later but it's edgar wright and quentin tarantino just talking yeah. over the which movie. is wild i didn't um, get to listen to that but i learned yeah, about it yeah I've, I've seen this movie enough that my rewatch for this included the commentary tracks. And I did stumble across on one of those quotes where he was like, all the titles of these movies are, it's like, there's a, a bucket full of adjectives and a bucket full of nouns. And they would just draw one of each. And like, there, there you go. Lethal weapon. Well, we not, did it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, even yeah. point break. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's technically a surfing yeah. term, <laughs> you know, but yeah. like, um, but what was, so, so it came out in, in, in 07, so squarely in all of our, uh, you know, we were all grown ups loving movies by, by 2007. Um, so what, when was the last time you guys watched this movie? But I gotta be to honest. This week. I watched it last, I rewatched it last night. I knew I had seen it because I specifically remember going to see it when I was in high school with my friend Sam. Um, but I didn't remember, like, any of it so it was almost and i the weird thing is i've rewatched uh like Shaun of the dead i've recently rewatched at world's end uh but for some reason i have not revisited this in a long time this is this was my jam upon revisiting it and it also comes within i was telling cal about this i am so passionate about like the period of time between maybe 2004 and 2014 where you could go to the theaters at any time and see a really, really good mid-budget comedy. Like that was the golden era for it. And I feel like it just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Like you had, I was so passionate about like Bottoms last year. Cause I was like, finally, like a silly mid-budget comedy, we're back. And like, they just don't make them like that anymore. And so many of what? my formative movies were from that era. Yeah. What was the budget on this? That's one number I didn't even, I, I think I didn't it was like 10, 10 yeah, to 12 million. Yeah, it's not that much million, money. Something like that. Yeah. The car chase, like the car chases, are kind of like, you know, they're not, they're really well done, but they're low stakes. 
you know, it's like two cars yeah. down like closed roads and stuff like that. It's not like they have to like shut down highways and well, and out in the country and all, yeah. all kinds of stuff. So like, but the, uh, I do, um, the amount of coverage, the sheer volume of shots in this movie. I mean, it's gotta oh, be in it's thousands. so aggressively I mean, like, edited. It's, <laughs> aggressive. Yeah. And which is like, to me, the story of this movie, right? Like this is an incredibly well, well cut film. Um, and we're also going to have my favorite conversation to have of the, does this count as a spoof conversation? Um, oh, yeah. Because, yes, absolutely. you know, it's, but they're, they're so clearly, they so clearly love the movies that they're, that they're impersonating, I guess. Are we, are we, are so we trying like, to, when you say spoof, you mean like, is this, are we trying to differentiate the nuance between spoof and homage? Or, right? Yeah. And parody and satire. And it's not satire for sure. It's not satire, but. Like, but it, at what point is there – I think I, I, the only reason that I feel like there's, it's worth delineating is I feel like the word spoof becomes kind of a pejorative at some point, which is not the intention at all. Like I like you can you can lovingly homage a movie and it still be a spoof. And and I did read one thing where, where I think Simon Pegg kind of bristles at the idea of this being a spoof because he just like – they love making it so much and they're just making a movie in the style of, you know, Bad Boys 2 and Point Break. So it's like – it's kind of a spoof because it's funny. Like, is it just that it's funny that that it becomes a spoof? I'm getting really philosophical. No, but for I think no, it, reason I, no I, I don't know that I agree with Edgar because it does kind of take the piss out of action movies a little bit, right? Like, it kind of no, very much hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's entire does. it's his entire premise of just like the like, uh, you know, I don't want to call like the like the like British cops lazy, but like they are not action oriented, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, it, but you know what it is, though. I mean, it's they don't the, have. The, yeah, they're just, it's the paperwork montages. Yeah, you know, from the Tony Scott film. You know, like that's, of a double, like the double like, exposures of the. Uh, yeah, yeah, and all those like hand cranked cameras and and all of that stuff. Like it's, the, it's so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's making it's not making fun of it. It's making fun of the idea of. I don't know. I mean, it, I, I'm not entirely sure how to. But it's a spoof. I, I, I think it's I a spoof. Actually, I, I agree. What I wanted to, what I was going to talk about later that when we we're talking about like a brilliant moments and stuff like that is how they use like sound cues and camera work to play up the drama of the mundane, which is, I think exactly mm -hmm. what you're trying to get at here. Right? Like yeah. when he's like staring down the guy at the grocery store, it's doing like snap zooms and like cut ins and it's like playing mm -hmm. up the musical tension and stuff like that. And really it's just two guys staring at each other in a grocery store. But like, it's cut and shot like a hot, like a really yeah. tense moment in like a nineties, like Jan I mean, Bond action movie. Yeah. Well, and it even goes farther back than that. Right. I mean, it goes, to, that's Leone stuff, you know, it's just two guys, yeah. uh, two grizzled dudes staring at each other, you know? And so like the, the, which is another part of the story of this movie to me is like what an encyclopedia Edgar Wright is about, about film and film history. Anytime you hear him on a podcast or an interview or anything like the guy knows, Everything about every movie is what it seems like to me. Mm -hmm. But like he's just one of those guys that it's all just rattling around up there, which is why the commentary track with him and Tarantino was so interesting because Tarantino is the same, the same way. Um, but it was funny because listening to that – and you can find all of these on YouTube and everything. I just like stumbled through a rabbit hole and, and sort of you know spot checked a bunch of these different audio, audio commentary tracks. But like it, it, the one with him and Tarantino, I don't think they actually talk about Hot Fuzz ever. No. <laughs> they're just talking they're, they're just, just they're rattling vibing off about movies. every <laughs> other movie that is sort of like the the influence of which is on screen right and so they're talking one of the, the scenes that i watched was the them breaking down the the foot chase right which the um where he's chasing with the first time he jumps over the fences and he's chasing the, the shoplifter and instead of like talking about that scene they talk about like edgar wright calls him back garden chases and it's, as it's like a subgenre of action and where he's like well i thought you know this was uh, inspired by Point Break, but the serious version – but Point Break was just the serious version of the one they did in Raising Arizona. And that was just the funny version of the one they did in this other movie. And then Ferris Bueller came out the same year. So, and it's like this nesting doll of influences. Um, and it's just it, – and to hear them both go back and forth about it. And they never talked about Hot Fuzz once. Like they, I mean, they rattled hilarious. off a thousand other movies. <laughs> but it's it was honestly hard to keep track of. Like I, I couldn't, couldn't keep up with either of them. So. For the gardens – 
What's the matter, Danny? You've never taken a shortcut before. This also supports my theory that this movie was just dudes having fun. Like, to me, it's like Edgar Wright is a filmmaker, he had a budget, and he got to essentially smush together every action movie he ever loved. Like, how yeah. can you not have fun doing that? No wonder it comes across. Oh, but people have failed at this. Oh, yeah. But people are a little he, lesser than Edgar Wright, yeah. to be fair. Because, like, Kevin Smith's also, like, the kind of guy that did, that, like, has seen every movie and knows everything. And, like, his version yep. of this movie, which was Cop Out, is... Nowhere near as good as this, but it right. does have maybe the best Tracy Morgan gif of all time where it's just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Do you not remember? It? Like no. where they're sitting in the car. And I don't, like I don't even know that one. I never saw that one. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's uh, TBS afternoon mediocre, you know? Sure. Oh, yeah. you, you wouldn't mind wasting the afternoon away from it, but the fact that yeah. I've like wasted synapses on moments of that movie. I don't know what that says about me. This is a very, yeah. yeah, This is a very much better version of that kind of thing, right? Which is like the tongue-in-cheek action buddy cop comedy that is totally postmodern because of its sheer volume of awareness of the medium that preceded it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a spoof can be loving. I don't know. Edgar Wright's a really. I would say most spoofs are. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I feel like those are the the kinds that are that are worthwhile. I mean, there's movies, and I feel like I've invoked hot fuzz in this conversation before on previous episodes. Like I think we're, I talked about it when we were talking about three amigos and whether or not that was a spoof and like, you know, Monty Python and things like that, that are, you have to know the rules that you're making fun of back to front. If you want to actually make fun of them. Like I like, I like my spoofs to be able to, you can mistake them for the thing that they're spoofing, right? Like this could have been a Tony Scott movie. If you just well, you like, you would say the same for the Shaun of the off, Dead you know? too. Like, exactly. Which I, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that Edgar Wright is, is, so good at and you can talk you can say that about you know baby driver and and last night in soho and like all of his films are so heavily um so heavily homage laden like they're you know they're all referencing something or they're all like oh i want to make a style of movie like this 70s horror film that i used to love and things like that so he and tarantino are both really good at that but um but to talk about the a, a little more of the pedigree, um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost at the front of this movie are, ch- are so good together. And at this point, they I'm, I'm not sure were they childhood friends or did they just know each other no. forever? I can't remember I don't which think one so. is there. They, they've been working together for a long time uh, at at the very least because uh, they came up doing Spaced and some other stuff like that. And um, but the rest the rest of the cast in this movie is is remarkable. Like opening with Martin Freeman and Steve Coogan and Bill Nye and then Timothy Dalton's there and Jim Broadbent and Jim Broadbent, who supposedly asked them to be in this movie. Um, That's such a flex. Apparently, he apparently cornered them at some award show at some point and was like, you got to put me in one of your movies, please. Um, and Olivia Coleman is there yeah. and Patty oh Constantine and, and Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett, or her eyes at least are in it. You know, yeah. like it's best cameo it's, I've it's seen. It's incredible. In a oh, when I learned about that, my mind was so I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like looking stuff up so for the movie. I was like, that was Kate. <laughs> that's in the scene early, early on in the movie where he's he goes to see his girlfriend, and she's yeah, it's, a crime it's, it's scene investigator. And everybody in the room is covered in in like, you know, the little paper hoods and the masks, and it's Kate Blanchett underneath yeah. all of that, which is it's so. <laughs> So Imagine funny being that so cool we got that Kate Blanchett. Get- We're going <laughs> to yeah, cover her yeah, up completely. Her. Like, <laughs> it's so good. No, this cast is incredible. And I don't it's know. Incredible. I just, I, yeah. I, and I, I also, love- the other cameo that I love real before we get too far away from it yeah. is Peter Jackson as Santa Claus. Yeah. Yeah, the the Santa Claus that stabs him in the hand in the beginning. It's, he's in it's half a shot in a still frame, but it's Peter Jackson. Like it's so funny. You know, we really misuse. I think in modern the modern zeitgeist, we really misuse the term cameo as like a famous person appearing briefly. These are cameos. These are like you might not know that it's Peter Jackson and Kate Blanchett. Perfect We're, cameos. Still. You would have no reason to assume that is Peter Jackson. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's wild. Yeah. Um, 
As far we talked a little bit about the box office. I mean, it made a bunch of money. It, it doubled what Shaun of the Dead did. And like, um, you know, it's it, it, awards wise, like there's no there's no spy number for this, unfortunately. Although although I did find Edgar Wright has a top ten list on the Criterion Channel somewhere. Of course um, he does. Yeah, uh, as you'd expect. Uh, but the M- Empire Magazine, the Empire Awards. Gave it a handful of awards in, in 2007. Oh, yes. Nominations. Actually won Best Comedy, but it was nominated for Best British Film, Best Actor, Best Director, those kind of things. So like it's – it has been a beloved movie since it since it came out, I think. From the jump, everybody has by and large loved this movie. It's kind uh, of hard I to think hate, right? Rare. It is. You have to yeah. be very cynical to not like it. Yeah. I mean real cranky. Or you have to have a very specifically opposite sense of humor. Like, I do. I, I do have a friend. I was I was texting my friend last night. She doesn't like it, but she doesn't like action movies. So I don't. It's very much an action movie. Yeah, it's a prerequisite. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, you got to get action movies to understand any of what they're doing. Real quick though, do you guys think it's the best of the of the? No. What the do you, Cor- Cornetto Cornano yeah. trilogy. Yeah. What do you think no. is the best? Shot of the Dead. Yeah, I agree. I yeah, I think that this uh, I think this movie is great and it stands on its own, but it very much swims in the wake of Shaun of the Dead, mm-hmm. and it uses a lot of the same uh, filmmaking filmmaking techniques that have now subsequently became like part of Edgar Wright's style, which is to your point, right? The quick cutting, the uh, the like really the really elaborate coverage. And then um, incredible th- transitions. Yeah, mm-hmm. incredible like, transitions. The way and they also, move from scene to scene is incredible. And also using like media as a form of like, uh, nar- like narrative exposition, right? Like, like in Shaun of the Dead, the montage of when he's flipping through the channels and it's just telling him that like there's a zombie apocalypse, but it's all unrelated clips. They do the same thing here with. Um, when they rewatch bad boys too and it mm-hmm. also works here but i i just remember watching that for the first like the first time you do it is really special and every time after that it's kind of like a law of diminishing returns kind of thing which is yeah it's still done well here it's just that shot of the dead was un, like next level good unlike anything we've ever seen before. And it was also riding the cusp of the zombie renaissance Mm -hmm. where there wasn't really like a lull in action movies, you know? Yeah. Well, this is not a Shaun of the Dead episode, but I will say I saw Shaun of the Dead before I saw Dawn of the Dead. Still enjoyed the crap out of it. Like, and then I enjoyed Dawn of the Dead more because I had Shaun of the Dead in my head the whole time. Yeah. It's like, it's growing up watching the Simpsons and then going back and seeing all the Stanley Kubrick references that they made. Yeah. Citizen Kane. Uh, when I went to college and saw Citizen came for the first time, the, the, my immediate thought of walking out of that that day's class was like, "Wow, a lot of Simpson references now make a lot more sense." <laughs> so many Simpsons references. Yeah. So many Simpsons Absolutely. references. Honestly, this one, I, this this one's my favorite of the three. I, Shaun of the Dead's great. I love Shaun of the Dead too. I mean, it's one and one A basically. Um, yeah. But I'm just more of an action movie guy than than I ever was a, a zombie or, or horror See, that's what I guy. think it is. So, I like, think it's this, also a, this one a just genre kind of speaks preference. To me. Yeah. I'm yeah, also more absolutely. of a horror girl than an action girl, so that's probably why I prefer yeah. it more. See, I'm more of an action I guy. Guarantee I guarantee you it that is. Mm-hmm. I, I like action movies more than I like horror, but I don't know. Shaun of the Dead really just really scratches that itch. And there's, it also does you're, like a You're lot right, the though. There is something, there's something to be said for the first the first. But I do think it's 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 tricky to hold that against Edgar Wright not that you're holding it against him, but like the idea that, you know, him trying different things or like the same thing just in a different setting or trying to evolve his style a little bit from movie to movie to movie, like some of that's going to happen. But like, even when he gets to Scott Pilgrim, right? Uh, Scott Pilgrim versus against the world is, um, uh, like the transitions in that are, I I think the best, like just strictly speaking trend transitions. Like that's the best work he's ever done. Like the way that they move from scene to scene in that movie is incredible, but, but it's all thanks to Shaun of the dead and hot fuzz and all the work that he'd done. And even going back to space, like it's just, it's been a style forever. So, and to your point, right. I also think that like, I really love the car chases in baby driver as Mm a aficionado of car chases. And I do think that like (laughs) this allowed him to like, 
do it in a low risk way and like kind of figure out how the nuts and bolts of like these like car chases work cuz like what's so great about this movie is these car chases feel intense but it's just like two cars driving down a street or just like doing e-brake turns around the village square where there's like nothing happening but they feel yeah. like like the the scene like where they're just like toward the end right it's like tim it's James Bond hanging out of a car, like shooting the handgun back, and they're just like going back and forth, and like it feels like the most intense thing ever. But you yep. know that they're just going like thirty miles an hour down like a country yeah. road where there's no real right. Danger. I can Im- and it's I can imagine the dailies for this movie are boring yeah. as hell, right? Yeah. Like there's so many just like car drives by, we pan with it, pan car drives by, we pan with it, and we add a little a little zoom. <laughs> Let's get into brilliant moments. Cal, you got uh, one? Get up. Yeah, let, let's just start. Let's just start with like a collection of brilliant moments because uh, the sum is greater than the parts of the whole, right? Which is yep. how ruthlessly good Edgar Wright is at doing setups and callbacks, like yes. through the entire movie. Right. And Shaun I, of the Dead does this too, but like, you know, like the fascist hag, the, uh, <laughs> made me laugh right? so much. For, like the fort of the greater good, the like, so what are you going to do? Arrest the whole village? You know, like all of these yep. things, they just, you, they keep on the, reusing. The setups and payoffs are yeah, incredible. Yeah, incredible. There's just so yep. many of them. And like, that is like, that I think is like what makes Edgar Wright movies stand out. And to your point of like, are they spoofs? Yes, but they are done so like they're like a spoof, like a weird Al Yankovic song, which is just like so <laughs> good. The artists hope that they can be parodied by Al Yankovic. Like right. to have your action movie spoofed in an Edgar Wright film is such a such the highest praise that an actor, an act like a traditional action director can get. That that's that's how I feel these movies work, yeah. and I think a big part of that is because like his scripts are just so f-ing tight. Yeah, yeah, they're very. Intentional. Apparently, it took eighteen months to to write this. You can I don't, tell. I don't, I'm hoping I'm not stepping on a tour here, but it took him eighteen a year and a half to write this script, and you can yeah, absolutely, you can tell. But even there's other bits like some because I I made that I wrote down a list of callbacks also you you rattled off a couple of them already but the other ones i have the the hedgehog that's in the riot room or the porcupine whatever that is survives the explosion at the end of the movie which is hilarious um is the only one school child at a, i can't imagine it is i oh think my it's God. just a weird the only one the, school the child little, <laughs> only one school child at a time and then they all rush in at the end to, to go get her it's incredible so with the, the dinging of the door and everything also one of my favorites is early in the movie when uh, they're on the walkie talkies and he overhears somebody saying um you know sergeant angel's coming into your store check out his arse and then he's check coming back to horse. town on the horse <laughs> check out his horse it's the exact same thing it's stuff like that. And then the swan that keeps showing up, the living the statue, swan, yeah. the, the trash can. People getting hit in the face with a trash can becomes a useful callback. You know, it's it's so it, – like the the meticulous uh, placement of that stuff early in the movie and the, in the very intentional way that it all gets paid off at the end is is – it's just so smart. Like there's – you know. Well, and that it, not to jump too far ahead to the shootout, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but I just couldn't believe how much I was laughing during the action scenes because you have, like, it's genuine. These are genuinely great action scenes, I think, just because yeah. of how, because of the coverage and how, how well, aggressively it's edited. But, like, yeah. I would be engrossed in the action scene and then the fascist hag thing would happen and I would be, like, mm-hmm. losing my sh- Like, it's so funny. Yeah. And again, like, this is a movie that is, is built on, uh, you know, a, a style that runs throughout. So it is hard to talk about like, well, there, there's this one brilliant moment of transition because the whole movie is built on, on transition. So it's, it's tricky to talk about sort of individual moments without talking about like a whole sort of stylistic theme that they're, they're doing. But one of the things that, that I think is so cool about this movie is how outlandish the gore and the violence is to the point where you're watching this action scene at the end. And they actually went through and, and like, uh, with, with, uh, uh, CGI and, and, and like yeah, in, the, in the, the big and shootout at the end, yeah. they added a bunch of squibs, but but like not in the background and like things blowing up in the distance behind them, and it's just adding chaos to it. 
And the blood is the same way. Like blood is so goopy and so fake looking that it allows you to laugh at it, right? Like it is so stupidly violent that it comes around the other side of being, you know, gross or off-putting or or whatever, or uncomfortable to watch. And it becomes just hilarious. Like, and I think the one that that we can do, if we have to pick one brilliant moment of gore, for me, it's the, the, the big pyre falling on mm-hmm. Tim Messenger, yeah. the newspaper guy. It's I also like the uh, so stupidly goopy um, and and hilarious. I also like Timothy Dalton's last lines are delivered. Well, what did the, he say? This, like this really hurts. Yeah. <laughs> this really hurts. Yeah, oh, but this so this scene where where the the they drop a a piece of battlement or whatever off the top of this church and it lands perfectly onto this guy's head. And he just sort of dances around a little bit and there's blood spurting and all this stuff and the way that it shot. I think there's even like digital blood on the camera or on the lens, um, you know, during it. It might be real. I don't know. Maybe because there's a lot of weird goop that's flying around in that scene. Um, But it's all been accentuated and it's all it's all extra Um, to the point where I kind of wonder if they shot this scene and they were like, you know what, I, I'm not laughing at it enough. And so like, go ahead and make it because that, that the blood that pops up, like the clearly CGI blood is clearly CGI. Like it doesn't look real even a little bit, but it still works in the moment. Like it's, it all adds up to this moment that you can laugh at of a guy getting brutally like crushed. Well, the other thing I like about this scene too, is how all the villagers, they don't, they're not really reacting appropriately to seeing this absolutely gruesome scene. Like they're shocked, but in yeah. real life, you would be like throwing well, up if you saw a someone. lot of them are a lot of them are in on it. Yeah, yeah, but that's <laughs> but that's good yeah. payoff for yeah. later too. No, I just love that they're all just like, oh no. It was for the greater good. It was for the greater good. The greater good. No, but it's I do love like that every time anybody yeah. says the greater good, the whole the whole room repeats the greater good. <laughs> His little jerky, like zombie motions too, when he's got the yeah, thing going. Yeah, the fact that he head. just he just stumbles around a little bit in a circle, and then and before he falls over, <laughs> and then all the villagers perfect. being like, "Oh man, oh, <laughs> that is not uh, the appropriate reaction yeah. to seeing what you just saw." <laughs> no, but you're right. Like it's, it's. I think even if I was watching this with someone who is squeamish, like I wouldn't be worried about it in a weird way. It's too. It's too cartoonish. Yeah, it's it's, it's so cause... much. Mm-hmm. Action movie violence is hilarious, and in its goriness, I don't know. I, I I distinctly remember one time, like I I remember being so horrible. Like I came home one day and my mom was like, "Hey, let's watch some TV," and I'm like, "Okay." So then we watched Nip Tuck, and they were doing like some like plastic surgery, and all yep. it did was push the scalpel to skin. And then you see like the blood kind of like seep up. And I got like so lightheaded. I had to like leave the room because I thought I was going to pass yep. out watching Nip Tuck with my mom. So <laughs> then like I went into my bedroom and I like I turned on like an action movie and I'm just like watching a yeah. guy just get pumped full of bullets. And I just you're in there. I, you're in there watching just, Total Recall and Paul yeah. Verhoeven's goopiest squibs of all time. And you're like, yep, this is this is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the party, Rick Dot. And, yeah. and like, you know, I feel exactly. nothing. I <laughs> he feel tosses nothing. the arms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, now man, that we've talked it about it. and Total Recall. Well, like now, like every time, like I, there's like a movie where it's like adjective noun, you know, random. Not <laughs> enough, <laughs> not enough Verhoeven references in this film, Clint. Maybe we should dock it some points for that. Like no one gets I, shot. I, I, you know, you, no, no one gets shot in the dick here. No, oh, there's no, but I, that's surprising. You know, one yeah. of the guys at the end does get, does get shot pretty brutally in the foot. Which, which is oh, kind that of was a, a, you can see it's like toe come off. That was pretty early. That's, that's I think the closest we get to to Verhoeven level level squibs. That and the church guy. Yeah, there was also like a bear like at the end in the bar with the uh, uh, bartender Roy. I think his name is like a bear trap kind of falls on his head. That was pretty gnarly. Yeah, yeah that was pretty good. Yeah. I love the I love yeah. the Billy Bats reference. The Goodfellas the Goodfellas reference was also. Mm-hmm. Really, really. There's a couple watch. of references. There's a there's a shining reference, right? Kind of built built in right in, up front, where he goes to check into the hotel, and she says, "You've always been here." Yeah. Like there's there's a handful of just random me, other movie references that let me that ask you show this, up. Let me ask you this: A, one of my favorite parts about this movie is the miniature town. Oh the, yeah. The miniature mm-hmm. of the town is that all? Like, is that also 
in at least like a diet shining reference in so far as like is that not is that not just kind of like also operating as like the hedge maze the hedge maze a little bit yeah oh um, maybe I am s- i stretching there i think, I think you are i feel I like i feel meant, like it can it. work if you want it to yeah. yeah like if you really want that to work uh it certainly can God, Edgar Wright really loves. We should have Edgar Wright. Why don't you come on Cinefix? This is my formal invitation. I feel like it'd be really fun okay. to sit and vibe about movies with him. I don't know. Absolutely. Any other? Any other? Really before Edgar gets here. Before Edgar arrives. Before, yeah, because it's a lot. Of, it's embarrassing to talk about somebody's own movie in front of them like this. I think so. Oh yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to. Uh, you want to take this higher? Yes, yes, I do. Do you want me to bother the chief inspector with this? Yes. You want me to get the chief inspector to come all the way down here? Yes, I do. Okay. Kenneth! Hello, Nicholas. How's it happen? Still a bit stiff. Chief Inspector. Keep your seat. Now, I know what you're going to say, but the fact is, you've been making us all look bad. Do we want to, I mean, we, we kind of cruise right through the, the big shootout, but one of the other things, and I, I sort of touched on it a little bit earlier uh, in a more general way, but one of the, the cool things about the the main square shootout at the end is um, they use hand cranked cameras for that, which is an old Tony Scott trick. So it's not that there's, there's speed ramps or like really specific fast, you know, fast or slow motion or anything like that. It's just... Um, it's just uh, inconsistent, right? Like, so the cameras are actually being manually cranked. So they're not at a consistent 24 frames or anything like that, uh, which is such a cool, cool effect. And all of that jittery stuff, all of that double exposure stuff that that makes makes it feel super chaotic. And, and you know, Tony Scott was always the best at it. Tony Scott made a movie about two guys driving a train in, in like the cab of a train, thrilling oh, yeah. somehow. Um, the unstoppable was, so, it was a movie that should not have been good, but it was incredible specifically because of Tony Scott. But, um, but they're doing all of that in this, in this last shootout, which makes everything so wild and so chaotic. And it's just such a cool effect that you don't see very often. I really do love the little town. The other thing I really like about all the action scenes is how funny the sound design is. Um, there's like a couple specific instances of this. One is in the big town shootout when uh, the woman is bicycling up and uh, Nick Frost opens the police car door and she flips over it and just thumps on the ground. Uh, The other time it made me laugh was in the supermarket, which was a great scene. And Olivia Coleman whacked that woman in the face and you could hear the squelch. Like such good, funny comedy sound design throughout all these actions. Nothing like a little girl on girl. Yeah. Oh my God, she's so. F- I want to hang out with Olivia <laughs> Coleman's character so bad and just make she's dick jokes so, all day. I love so her so funny. much. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the sound design in general in this movie is is, is so creative and and because it kind of doesn't give a shit, right. Like it's no because yeah. there's some really goofy stuff that happens. There's one scene in the bar where Timothy Dalton accidentally like burns the lens. Like yep. he he's he's like toasting and he accidentally looks at the camera. They add a, instead of like trying to fix it or, or using a different take, they add a cash register sound. Like, like it's just like, <laughs> I don't think I when he like that. accidentally, <laughs> it's, it happens really fast, but he just like accidentally looks at the lens and it's like, ching, like as, as they do it. So instead of like trying to work around it in a different way, they just like they put their thumb on it. Like it's, it's again, to, to your point about like, these are just a lot of people having a good time making a fun movie. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, even like, like in the grocery store right it's like the butchers just have knives that they're throwing at the (laughs) cops and that and that is what's stopping these fully armed police officers with bulletproof vests and riot gear and weapons it's just like the butchers like with throwing knives they got knives (laughs) they got a load of cutlery um yeah and uh, you know and then getting like a face full of bolognese and like the every it just and there's even that's another thing that's this sort of like I feel like this episode is turning into like the uh the general just everything about this movie is so cool and it's hard to talk about one particular instance of it but there's like to highlight another thing that this movie does so well is like the attention to detail 
when the two bartenders are shooting, when they're shooting back and forth at the two bartenders, there's a sign behind the bar that says two shooters for the price of one. <laughs> it's just like there's a joke written on a chalkboard behind the bar uh, that you could just like, and they just pan away from it real fast, but two shooters for the price of one. And it's just like, even, even in the set deck for this one scene, it's like, let's figure out what we're going to do with the bottom right hand corner of this frame. You know, let's put a joke there. There's room for a joke there, uh, oh which God, is incredible. So it funny. makes, it makes it a, it makes it a movie that's worth watching a, a million times. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. Like it's built for rewatchability. I've only seen it again mm -hmm. twice. I saw it when I first saw it back in 2007 and then last night, now I'm like, damn, like after talking to someone who really likes it a lot, I've got to sit down and like really like comb <laughs> through it. Like, and I feel like you could probably say that with most of Edgar Wright's movies, but especially this one. No, yeah, that's, I... that's, that's their thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you guys a question? No. Why do British people just hate bypasses? I feel like so many movies, like like both this and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, all go to shit because a bypass is being built in town. Those those roads are wacky. Though. Like Let me what, one one is an intergalactic yeah. bypass, and then the other is just like, you know, they're just trying to murder all these people who have information in this bypass getting getting built through town. And I just think, I think it's like really I think it's a really weird like trope of like up oh, up. Oh, yeah, it's like an old. Old people tradition, something or other. I don't know. I'm not British. I, mean, I can't answer that. Yeah. There's a lot of, of small town weirdness happening in this movie. It's kind of the whole movie. It's all good, Clint. We could talk about the British. You should see our British colleagues talk about America. <gasps> Do they talk? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, I, Alex asked me to like proofread one of the GTA things. Did you delete all the U's, all the extra U's? No, no, it, was, it wasn't so much for the print. I was just like, dude, you could clearly tell that this was written by someone who does not spend time in America. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, they're talking about, like, our, like satire on our country, and it's just like, whoa. You got to you gotta know something well to satire it. Yeah, I mean. Like, let's just yep. let's change these couple of things here. Yeah. We love the British uh, here. Take their, take, their, take your bypasses back then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what's what's interesting about this movie too, and, and Edgar Wright's work in general is like he's he's such a good craftsman. Like all of this, all of the stuff that we've talked about, right? All of the the editing techniques that he's used, like the massive amounts of coverage that they shoot, the the way that he transitions from one scene to the other, but all the detail that's packed into every every screen, and like. It's it's hard to to think of like is this movie? It's like this is a comedy that's also a like a capital F film, right? Like it's oh, it yeah. feels right. like it's the craft that's been put into this is so expert that you can't write it off. And maybe, maybe that's part of what is difficult about the conversation of whether or not it's a spoof. You know, if there is any sort of like pejorative angle to the to the idea of being a spoof or if it sort of like writes it off as not being a, a real movie because it's a spoof or whatever like none of that applies to to hot fuzz because of all of the um just i mean just how good everything is being put together like even the flips and stuff in in some of the the chases are they're cut like so well because number one they cut them like normal stunts, right? Like stuntman does a flip, goes off frame, Simon Pegg pops up, right? Like that's the way that you do uh, a stunt. But they, the way that they also cut, cut it in this one is they cut it just slowly enough that it registers as a joke as well. You know, like it registers as a stunt and then also it, it's cut right in this perfect little happy medium pace to where it registers as a stunt and it registers as a joke which is a, a weird and remarkable skill. I will say, when I, I think maybe my hardest laugh in this whole movie, and I saw it coming, it was the fence jumping, it was, it was uh, Simon Pegg jumping the fences like an action hero, and then Nick Frost just barreling through it. I knew oh, yeah. that joke was coming. Right. I knew it was coming. That was in the trailers. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it was still so funny. Just the like the way the like oh my god, I'm sorry, I'm watching it now and him <laughs> It's it's funny too because he doesn't even he doesn't even jump. He's like he falls faced. before he even gets to the fence. <laughs> too. Like he falls like face first into the bottom. And then he was like, fence. Oh, that didn't work. I've gotta actually jump. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. I, I also I also you. read a thing where where Nick Frost like he falls through the fence and then when he stands up, he looks backwards. And he did that on purpose because he wanted people to really know he did that. <laughs> like he didn't want it to. 
he didn't want it to seem like he got a stunt double to do it for him. He's like, I want to, I'm getting credit for this. So I'm crashing through the fence. I'm standing up. I'm looking back at the camera. Uh, the other fun thing I read about Nick Frost in this movie was that he would only do it if he got to choose his character's name. And the fact that he shows <laughs> Danny Butterman is hilarious to me. That was his yeah. like one condition was like, I got to be named Which, Danny Butterman. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Which I guess they had to rename the his dad Butterman too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, the, interesting thing, well, the interesting thing was, is like earlier drafts of this film, like that was a woman and they kind of wrote oh. it as a love interest. And then they realized that. I, like, I would argue they still did. Yeah. Wait, that's because I, yeah. I want to talk so, about this. So, I felt like they were going to kiss the whole time. Yeah. I was waiting so for the kiss. A lot, a lot of, a lot of the like woman love interest dialogue just was like wholesale copied and pasted. That's, to, I didn't know. Nick that's Frost. not a tour because so I didn't of, know that. One of the other, one of the other brilliant moments is this scene uh, yeah. that I flagged anyway, is this scene yeah. of them on the what couch when they're going watch. to watch the movies. And like, they are, this is a scene where traditionally these two characters would start making out. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's even so and they get, they get real close to doing it in this scene too. And then also like when he goes and, you know, buys, he wants to buy the plant for his birthday and like all of these, like there is a romance subplot that is, that is, it's not like, it's, it's not, not being made fun of. Think, it's not yeah. being, and it's not subtle, but it's, it's, it's very much there and it's perfect. I believe they call those bromances. No, but I, I didn't think it was a. Yeah. I didn't think it was a bromance. I thought they were gen like even so even before the couch scene, which I liked a lot. Um, they have that scene where they're standing outside of his house, and he's like, "Do you want to come in? Yeah. Do you want to have like you maybe come in? one more beer? <laughs> like it's such a yeah. like I don't even think it's a bromance. I think they're genuinely in love the whole movie, and I wanted them to kiss, mm -hmm. but that's how I feel about. It. But they have like such great chemistry. I don't know. Also, if they the interesting ever yeah, make a sequel. If they ever make a sequel, I want them to kiss. That is my, again, Edgar Wright, I know you're watching this. Please have them kiss. <laughs> um, but like, I Or don't just know, be I really, married by the yeah, time we meet them in like the sequel. Or just be like dudes being Nobody's married, awesome. living together. Uh, oh, and yeah. I, I also like the dynamic uh, of Simon Pegg being the one with his crap together for the most part, because that is not the case in the other Cornetto trilogy movies. I feel like he's always kind of the dirtbag. Uh, but at the same time, yeah. he doesn't really have his crap together because he's so obsessed with work that uh, Kate Blanchett left him. So, well, he broke up with her. <laughs> the eyes of Kate Blanchett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The eyes of Kate. Blanchett. It was his idea to to take a break, and the fact that they end it at um, you know he's bringing flowers to you know Butterman's mom's gravesite. Like it's such a that's such a couple thing to do. Yeah. And also, like, Nick Frost forsakes his own father for him. Like, I'm sorry, if that is not, if that's not your soulmate, I don't know what is. Which, I mean, that's, and let's, that's not a typically male character thing to do, right? Like, I feel like we've seen that out of, out of women on screen in terms of, like, you know, they leave their family or they, you know, they join the hero ultimately because that's just kind of their job to go and do. And so like, we never see a guy do that. A guy, particularly a guy turn on his own dad like that. That's true. I don't know. I'm trying to picture it with a woman and I'm trying to picture it if I would like it better. I don't know that no. I would. I yeah, don't I don't think I would. No, no, not, I think, not at all. Yeah, no. It, this plays into the buddy cop genre just so well. And just like the concept yeah. that they're, you know, in love. But I, that, and I, this, that kind of brings it back to like an ant. I, I love when movies are aggressively anti- toxic masculinity and that is this movie which is so funny mm -hmm. to see in like a cop movie that's not usually what you see in cop movies especially made in the year 2007 british cops Brit <laughs> not british real cops. cops not american cops the met I, I did read that quote too from from edgar wright about like why he wanted to make this movie in the first place in, in that you know english cinema doesn't really have a tradition of cop movies yeah. the way that yeah. like literally the rest of the world does um, especially, you know, obviously here in the States, but then like, you know, there's the, the Hong Kong action movies that are all, you know, the hard boileds and the super cops and, and all of that. Um, but there wasn't really a tradition of cop movies in, um, in England, which is a thing that he wanted to fix, I guess, or just. But did he fix it with this? Like, <laughs> no, is, like I don't think so. Yeah. Because <laughs> like half I mean, the movie a whole, is just like there's trying, a ton yeah. of procedurals on on you know the BBC channel that I get through our Amazon Prime subscription at home here that my wife super loves. Uh, but outside of like proper action buddy cop movies, like no, I don't think so. You know, 
yeah. Idris Elba has done really well for himself being a being a cop on TV, but a British cop, American criminal, British cop. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really liked the big NWA twist uh, again, mostly because it was funny, but also I'm a big sucker for the trope of like, oh, I'm stuck in a small town. And that just totally encapsulated it. He has this whole conspiracy going the entire movie. And the more he unravels it, the more it starts to make sense. Like that whole gardener scene where she's like, oh yeah, like I was supposed to, like he was gonna buy my house and then I was gonna move away and my cousin Sissy. And then it just all falls apart just because, oh yeah, man, we're just bored and petty. Like, and we, we we, yeah, yeah. we talked about this in the burbs, like people just creating problems because they're bored and they don't (laughs) have any other problems. Like this is, this is that. Uh, But I love that twist. By the way, that Gardner's monologue where just every time she mentioned one of their names, God rest her soul. Oh my God, that was so funny. Like the, it's, yeah, that's one of those, like the pace of that monologue and the way that, you know, God rest them, uh, God rest them both. God rest the pair of them. Like the way that it was peppered in throughout the monologue, like judiciously and it like escalated, right? Like, you know, she says it a couple of times and by the end of the monologue, she's like rattling off a bunch of, like the pace of that monologue is so well written um, that it's, you know, by the time she's done with it, it's, I'm just laughing at the whole thing. Well, also the, the talk about another scene, the scene uh, right after that, after he witnesses the murder and the scream guy, because they totally, it's totally an homage to uh, the scream guy. Uh, when he's in the police, uh, the uh, with the other policeman and he's like, and everyone's like, no, it's not a murder. And he's like, I saw it. I was literally there. I love exasperated acting. <laughs> Just being like, yeah. am I losing my mind? It made me laugh so yeah. much. We, have we, we haven't talked about the Andes yet. Uh, oh, the Andes. Uh, the Andes. No. The the two uh, detective sergeants or whatever their job their their rank is. The, the two Andy Patty Considine and and uh, what's his name uh, Rafi. The, detectives, um, the inspectors, right there. Inspectors. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the the even little things like you've got a you've got a mustache. I know it's like, (laughs) Oh, and we all sell apples here. Don't we? Like every, like they're so, uh, so their own ass and just so like determined to hate this guy. Um, but in such a smart and fun way, I mean, like that's, that's such a broad archetype for like small town cop to be doing that. Um, for them to pull it off in like a really fun and interesting way is, is one of the real highlights of the movie. Honestly, those two guys are hilarious. But then they kind of get their redemption the way arc that, at the in end. The, in too. the shootout, yeah, but in the shootout at the end too, when he gets the bolognese on his face, yeah. and the other Andy starts to, he gets like blood rage to defend his best friend. Like they're all of a sudden they care about each other in a very real way too, which is hilarious. I would watch a whole show about the this this force again, especially yeah. with Olivia oh, yeah. Coleman. <laughs> I don't know this the oh. whole movie. She was killing me. Uh, you don't mind a little manpower, do you? Um, <laughs> God, it's so. So good. Like I'm trying to think of some of the other one jokes with her. Like I don't know. They're they were all just good. I don't mind a little man. I there's another line that the, the other other note that I have uh, here. There's a a line about when they're talking about the human statues and the um, or the living statue, uh, and then the next stop if we don't deal with him will be up to our balls and jugglers, which is. <laughs> Which is so funny for at least two reasons. Like being up to your balls in something is just a goofy turn of phrase. But the fact that you're up to your balls in jugglers who use balls is – it's just like do, do they know what they're saying? And I don't think are – they, are they either like great at making bad puns or too dumb to realize they're making good puns? Like it's, it, it's tricky. But it's well, uh, up to our balls and jugglers. I, I, I think it's like one of the sneakiest smart lines in the in the entire movie. <laughs> well, also you mentioned the living statue. The living statue was such a funny like running motif. Because like also I would be okay. concerned about that. <laughs> when he first when they first yeah. introduce him and he's and he's showing pictures like here he is at eleven, here he is at one, <laughs> here he is at two. <laughs> I I feel like I would also be like we need to track this guy down. <laughs> what is he doing? Yeah. So good. Uh, um, I know you said this this okay. episode just can't be us talking about funny moments, but God, it's a really it's funny. It's just okay. starting to devolve into that. Um, yeah. 
We we tackled we, talk the, about, we tackled this intellectual stuff here about like his script t- like tight script how he does like yeah how he uses filmmaking devices yeah. in order to make a in order to make a good movie we we did the diligence all right we could have we should fun give ourselves make, more credit let we us, can have a little bit of fun, fun at the end yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let us laugh about the funny movie what we, thank um, you one one thing I do want to talk about before before we move into to the rest of our segments here but is the uh, what do we think about Timothy Dalton. We haven't talked much about him. Oh, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, as, no, I like him a lot. As the, the, the main villain of this movie. And just, I mean, um, A, the fact that they got a James Bond is just mm-hmm. very special. And yeah. Timothy Dalton looked like he had a great time doing this. Oh, mm-hmm. he's having the time of his life. Also, I love how obvious it is. The entire movie. It's yeah. like, yep, right. yep. Bad guy. Right there. Yeah. That's the one. Well, his I, name I is do, Simon Skinner. I, yeah. <laughs> and he's an asshole to everybody. Yeah. Um, and like we first meet him with, and he literally says, arrest me. I think that's the first, uh, the first, I'm the slasher is his first line. Like he's, he's yeah. doing a fun run and he jogs into frame and he says, arrest me. I'm the slasher. <laughs> it's like, that's how we meet him. <laughs> um, but he's such an obvious red herring that like, if he's not hamming it up like that the whole time, uh, then like the Agatha Christie kind of everybody's involved turn that happens at the end, like that's that doesn't work as well, I think, without how how great a villain Timothy Dalton is. You know, I mean, you know, we talked about it too in Three Amigos. This is another uh, going back to that, like how difficult it is to be a, a villain in a comedy. Um, mm-hmm. But he's so like in the same way that the squibs and the blood and everything that gets splattered in this movie needs to be heightened to the point where you're allowed to laugh at it. Like he's doing the same thing with like, I mean, he's, he's uh, chewing scenery and twirling mustaches and, and saying all the right terrible things. Like he's so good. Well, I mean, rolling up to the crime scene, uh, playing that dire Straits song, Romeo and Juliet. (laughs) It's like, it's so like, Come on, guy. Try a little bit. Good song, though. Uh, glad they used it. Can we speaking of Romeo and Juliet? Can we talk about the uh, the Cardigans <laughs> song that they did at the end of <laughs> yeah of Romeo and Juliet? Their performance of Romeo and Juliet. Oh, so I want do, I want to see that it's, full it's, thing. I hope that's somewhere on like a deleted like just, a, a bonus feature or just, something. The entirety of Romeo and Juliet. That's yes. what I would like. Yes. <laughs> They were Edgar so, Wright, I know you're listening. <laughs> they were so bad that the town took it upon themselves to murder them. <laughs> to murder those two. Yeah. But the way that they just like, they hop up at the end of Romeo and Juliet to sing, love oh me, God. love me. Oh. Um, it's great. And even this actress, Lucy Punch, like she's gone on to do a lot of very funny stuff. Um, like this, I, I just to circle back to the cast for just a second. Like it's, on top of James Bond, it's a, a who's who of anybody that's funny in in the UK. I think. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. I do think that uh, just before we move on, just to kind of wrap up the brilliant moment section, there's a, I did find another funny quote that I wanted to talk about. Is in all of our talk about all of the different movies that that this uh, Hot Fuzz is is kind of homaging or or pulling inspiration from, and um, there's a great line from from Edgar Wright from one of the commentary tracks, which was uh, somebody once asked me, oh, did you steal all your montages from Snatch? Uh, and I said, no, I stole them from Martin Scorsese like Guy Ritchie did. <laughs> which is like, <laughs> Wait, the, that's so clever. The idea, yeah, the idea that yeah. like in, you know, in 2007 when he's making this movie and, and obviously, you know, now 18 whatever years later, like – the fact that we're generationally three batches of filmmakers removed from some of these references, right? Like, it's like, no, I didn't steal it from Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie stole it from Martin. It's like my grandfather. Like, I, it's like a grand reference, you know? Like, um, just it's so it's so fitting for this movie that is is an incredible spoof and an incredible bunch of like this guy clearly loves movies and he loves to make them and they had a blast doing this one. And he understands them to a level that I'm frankly jealous of. <laughs> like it's for him to to be that aware of where he's pulling his his references from. Also, is is it's just so fun to hear. You know. All right, let's talk about movie lists. Innocent people don't run. Yeah, maybe it was our old friend the cactus thief. Oh yeah, he was a prickly customer, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Am I going completely mad? Maybe you are. Maybe you did it. Yeah. 
Seeing as though you're such a big fan of murder. What the? Sergeant Angel. Yes! Sir. Weirdly, not a one. As much as I like this movie, as much as I always have, it's not a single. That's it's got surprising. an honorable mentions here and there. Uh, you know, and I, it, it Shaun of the Dead has shown up more on the chain. We had a things you didn't know about Shaun of the Dead at one point. Um, uh, but we haven't talked much about Hot Fuzz. It got a mention in action movies in the action comedy section. It got a it got a shout out there. Wait, what took um, the action le- comedy if it wasn't then? Legend yeah. of Drunken Master. Okay. Hmm. So we went we went a little a little farther back than 2007 for for <laughs> that. Tad. As as is our our want to do, um, but I don't know. I mean, again, I gotta get a I gotta get a spoofs. Spoofs, I was, parodies, I, I think we've and talked about this in an episode. List going. Yeah, yeah. Like best spoof. Because uh, I feel like it would be there. I mean, the entire Cornetto trilogy ought to be uh, on it. Um, mm-hmm. Gotta get some naked gun. Any other list in there? there? Get some naked gun. Airplane and hot shots. Part two. Um, hot shots part two is the Godfather part two of the hot yeah. shots oeuvre. Uh, <laughs> I love hot shots part two. <laughs> Um, I had some friends that once counted – they counted the jokes and to to like calculate a jokes per minute of Hot Shots Part 2 and it's it, – they broke the scale. Like it's it's insane. I forget <laughs> what it was but it was you know, 65 jokes a minute or something like that. That's more than one per second? Yes. Wow. I'm making that up but also I kind of believe it. Uh, I think I brought – I think I specifically brought this up during the Robin Hood episode. Do we – like a best duos? We don't yeah. have that list, I don't no, think. But, but like there the, should like that would if we did, I feel like them in general, yeah, best, Nick Frost best, and Simon Peck would be in there for all of it. Buddy yeah, the, the buddy cop subgenre would be uh, would be one of the if I were to do a best duos, best on screen duos, buddy cops would be one of the categories, I think. Yeah. That's a good category. Because it would have to be like romantic married couples, yeah. you know, like romantic couples and then buddy cops and I'd have to figure out what, eight, what, eight more. That's couple. two of them that we got. Uh, you got odd you got couple. Odd that'd couples. be another one. Yeah, yeah. Just a little uh, little peek behind the curtain there on how we build our movie lists. Is you come up okay. with the one topic, and then you come up with ten different versions of that topic. Then you have to find examples for each of those ten versions, like eight or nine examples for each, and then you got to pick the one that most is most illustrative of that sub topic of the greater topic. That's in the headline of the movie list that you're currently watching. And so, then like, you got to write stuff about all 90, of them. 90 or 100 movies get get referenced at any given time. I got spreadsheets, man. It's it's hard. Any any other yeah. movie list we need to get in? On? I'll, I'll I'll do that. I do like the duos. That's yeah. a good one. We did best teams at some point, and and I think duos was a did sub, you say best subset teens? of teams. No. Teens. Although the teens in this movie, the teenagers in this movie were pretty great. I yeah. do like that they <laughs> came around at the child. end. Only one school child. <laughs> yeah, I do like that, that he ended up using the teens at the end to to get the the woman out of the out of the, the second floor window there. Also, um, have, Simon Pegg is so genuinely badass at, in, at the second half of this movie when he just rolls up and he's like, "You want to do some useful kids?" Like, definitely the most attractive I've ever found Simon yeah. Pegg. What's like? A, yeah, he was badass. Let's also not go. forget about yeah. Let's also not forget about Chekhov's sea uh, mine. You know, yeah, in the, con- in the country. <laughs> oh like, yeah. Let's yeah, check like, off sea mine. Check off ocean mine. <laughs> yeah, check off sea yeah. mine. I mean, if you're gonna show a sea mine in the in the in the first act, you, yeah. it has to explode. You gotta by the use end. it. Yeah, those are the rules. Um, <laughs> that's my favorite thing about about watching wrestling now is is check off's tables. Anytime somebody sets up, the table, <laughs> I'm gonna go through that table. It's that's gonna take one. it's gonna take a few more spots, but. Um, but you did know that bomb was going to come back. Like, oh, <laughs> it was yeah. so oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, like, another, this, the scene where, uh, you know, Argus Filch uh, from the Harry Potter movies just like whacks the sea mine. Uh, and everybody gets, it starts ticking. Yeah. And everybody, there's there's zooms and twists and camera moves, and the sound design is, is super intense. And then they run it. Like, it's, it's it's such a big joke built around an anticlimax 
too. That's really funny, which is kind of the the theme of this whole movie, right? Like it's an action scene that's treating paperwork, you know, like a Tony Scott, like a Tony Scott uh, shootout. Um, so the fact that they can treat an anti-climax joke about a sea mine that doesn't explode uh, with the same kind of weight is again, it's just that's why this movie's so good. Where on earth did you get these? Found them. You found them. And what is this? Sea mine. Sea mine. Shall we torf? Yeah. Let's torf. <clears throat> I feel like we've talked a lot about. I feel like surprisingly we haven't blown any torfs though. Um, okay, yeah, I was worried about that because just the way that I, know, I watched, <laughs> I, I dug around the comments areas, I was like, I'm probably going to step on some torfs here. You know what? We'll see. Um, okay. All right. True or false? Lead character Nicholas Angel was named in homage to magician Chris Angel, who is a close friend of actor Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg credits Chris Angel with helping him lose over two stones, which is 28 pounds, in preparation for the role. Hmm. I'm going to go false. Gonna go false. I yeah. I'm trying to remember the timeline of Chris Angel Mind Freak and when he was at his It would have been years before this. Yeah, I want to say it was like early like 2004ish. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when I saw him on all the Like when did he suspend himself above Las Vegas in a box for 3 days? I don't know. You remember when he did that? Vague. I, I, so the vague. guy, I was just like, this, this guy's not a, magi- I, a magician. I just, just used kind to of get that. I used to just get that guy and like pick up artists, artists, just like mix. Oh, excuse you, Chris Angel is his own brand. <laughs> mind freak. He's you guys remember mind freak and that that whole like opening that was so yeah. serious where he's like heavy metal screaming mind freak. The best thing that Chris Angel ever did, and this will be the last of our Chris Angel tangent, uh, <laughs> that was he went to Har- he went to Harrison Ford's home and did close up magic uh, oh, to where like. Christ. He somehow hid hid uh, uh, the card that Harrison Ford picked inside an orange in Harrison this Ford's is, kitchen. This and is the guy. Harrison that- Ford's face. It's all. It's all. You can find this clip. But Harrison Ford is just this old man who is terrified of what he's just seen. <laughs> completely baffled. I think he was a little bit high. Uh, and then he tells him to get the fuck out of my house. And it's it's kind of wonderful. But that's the only that's- great thing that Chris Angel ever did. Um, That's amazing. I think Harrison I'm, Ford left that and immediately crashed his plane on a golf course uh, shortly <laughs> after <crash. that> filming. <laughs> he, he is good at that. And he does do he, that also, time to time. I've played that course, actually. It's, <laughs> while, while, while Harrison Ford was flying over? No. <laughs> Although after that happened, every time I went there, I was like, I really hope he crashes today. <laughs> is that a, play, this is is that a nine prop plane? This is his little, little nine-hole course right next to the Santa Monica Airport. <laughs> Um, I could I know, not like keep the it together. Holy, it's <laughs> honestly like the hole that he landed on looks like a runway. Like I, he's just anyway. <laughs> so two things. About I don't know it. that he crashed his plane so much as he accidentally landed on. Is this by the way? It's false, right? It, yeah, it is false. Yeah, but I couldn't. I like Tyra wrote. <laughs> why are they Chris Angel experts? Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> First off, like, why are you guys? You get to be a certain age, and you just kind of accidentally become a Chris Angel expert. You just learned to hate. You just learned to hate Chris Angel because, like, this is the guy. (laughs) This is the guy that apparently only wore button-down shirts that just didn't have buttons. Because it's just like he's just Listen, bare, you, you he's just bare, he's just bare-chested in front of him. You flaunt what you got. The man's do you think that he? Yeah. Do you think that he removed the buttons or that he got shirts custom made without buttons? I, I, you know what? They right. disappeared. I, I, he made them disappear somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great joke. Mm-hmm. But oh, by the way, I was close. His, <laughs> his show, his show premiered <laughs> in two thousand and five, not two thousand and four. That's how you knew it was false. N- no, I just, I mean, listen. Hey, what? I, I would have never forgiven Tayo if that was the the technicality that he got yeah. us on for, for that. Reason. <laughs> no, actually, Mind Freak premiered in two thousand five, not two thousand four. Gotcha. L- l- listen. <laughs> As like a like, like as a like as a punk kid with studded belts in like two thousand and like around this time, I always had a little bit of disdain for the kids that took it too far. And that was Chris Angel. Mm-hmm. And that was definitely Chris Angel. Oh my god! Yeah. Uh, well, neither like, Tayo like, nor I expected you guys to be Chris Angel like, experts. So. Seamster try well, hard. I'm so sorry to disappoint kind of- you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm delighted. Are you kidding me? I. I'm a little sorry for myself. Uh, well, if you'd also. like to know the uh, the truth of his name, 
Uh, whilst doing research for the film, Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg discovered a disproportionate number of police officers were named either Nick or Andy, which led the char- to the character names Nicholas Angel and the two Andys. Uh, the Angel part of Nicholas Angel was named after the film's music director, and the joke where the local paper misspelled Angel's name as Angle, also a good joke, uh, was based on yeah. several incidents where this happened to him. So, <laughs> That's fun great. fact, but I do like I did I did notice that. I made a note of that when I was because I did notice that in the credits is the music supervisor's oh. name is Nick Angel, oh, yeah. which I was yeah. like, it can't be a coincidence. Okay. And I wonder if they're All giving right. if like Simon Pegg picked the songs and so they credit him as Nick. anyway, because but I guess it's just a whole other person. All right. True or false. Although Bill Bailey plays two different Sergeant Turners, they both wear a uniform with the service number 101, even when they are appearing in the same scene. True or false. Ooh. Clint, this is, I feel like go this true. is going to test your... I didn't... Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go I did, I did not notice that. I do know um, the book that they read is... I was like, the hair was all different and, and everything, and that's how you kind of tell them apart. But they all they were also reading very similar books. Uh, and that's how you tell them. But I, I have no idea what the badge number is. I'm going to go... I'm going to go true, though, just because it was kind of a cheap movie and maybe they needed uh, uh, to save on costumes. Or they just didn't think about it. Okay, Cal. True. Yeah, I agree. Wouldn't it be funny if it was false just because like the number was like 102? Uh, no, we're yeah, not that mean. Yeah, it would be. But- <laughs> yeah. We're not, not that yet, mean. It would anyway. be a lot cooler <laughs> if he did. I mean, there's no Chris Angel. Uh, no, that is that is true, which is, is fun. Uh, one of the characters reads Complicity by Ian Banks, while the other reads two novels by Ian M. Banks. Uh-huh. They are, in fact, yes. all written by yeah, the same the author. Right yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, same guy. Uh, this split is clearly supposed to symbolize differences in the two characters' personalities. Funny. That's details. Different. Details. Edgar Wright loves those details. Simon Pegg does too, I imagine. All right, true or false? The names of the townspeople of Sanford are almost all words for occupations or activities. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I feel like yeah. there was a... Uh, who Who was it? I feel like there was a... A potter and a, it's, a, a, yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. It was Porter. Uh, but that is true. Porter. Yeah. Porter. Yeah. Cooper, Porter, Turner, Shooter, uh, Hatcher, Paver, Butcher, Skinner. Fit, yeah. Skinner. Yeah. 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 Skinner. Yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I mean, when you. <laughs> no. uh, okay. True or false? Cousin Sissy. Cousin Sissy. Yeah. Great nickname. <laughs> Uh, the filming so of funny Angel- too. By the way, real yeah. quick tangent. Oh, yeah. the, the, when the Andes were there to confirm, it's like, oh, yeah, Cousin yeah. Sissy. Like, and they kind we of made fun of him. Yeah. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. thank you. And then he just keeps cruising right past it. Like, it's, it's perfect. Timothy Dalton. Utterly man. perfect. He's really good in this. Um, yeah. All right, true or false? The filming of Angel and Skinner's first meeting at the supermarket was completed in just one take. In DVD commentary, Simon Pegg commented that scenes with Timothy Dalton were felt extremely natural. But first part, true or false? First part is false. Uh, the for all in one take. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go false. This is not. I didn't. This is not one of the commentaries I listened. I was gonna to. say. I didn't. Yeah, they, I missed, they shot I that over this multiple part. days. I did. I did. I did bounce around a little bit in in, in my commentary adventure. So. They shot so I had more. Place. I had multiple to choose from. So, I mean, there's a lot. I gotta watch the Quentin Tarantino one. All right. So, uh, so you say true, Clint? I and you say false. No, Kyle? I think it's false. I think yeah, I don't think false. they shot it in one take. Okay. Um, yeah, false. They didn't shoot it in one take. Damn, we can't get you this episode. Uh, yeah, the conversation w- is false. Uh, the conversation was filmed entirely from Timothy Dalton's perspective first. Uh, the next day, early in the morning, they were to film the conversation with Angel's perspective and close-ups. Dalton, much to the surprise of the crew, showed up early the next morning, and even though he wasn't going to be on camera for that particular portion of the filming, he sat off camera in Skinner's chair and played the role so that Simon Pegg would be able to have him work with uh, while filming his part as Angel. Pegg stated that it really showed Dalton's professionalism. Aww. That is, that's, that's genuine class right there. Genuine class. Yeah. Genuine that, professionalism. That's, that's, that's theater acting. That is theater. The like, yeah. He came he came up in the theater. That's fun. Okay. Last Torf. We touched on this. Last Torf. But still, 
Uh, it features four actors fr- from various Lord of the Rings movie adaptations. Various sure. Lord of the Rings movie adaptations. Um, I feel uh, like I can name sh- sure three, so I'll I'll just venture that there's a fourth. I'm gonna three. I'm gonna go false just just uh, to make it interesting. Um, who, but if I'm, you can gonna, name three, go ahead. Who are the three? Well, wait. Okay, so we got now. Maybe I can only name two. Actually, I can name one. I'm gonna. I'm just going with my guy here. I think it's true. <laughs> but you don't want to name. Him. I'm gonna go false. So I know. I know Martin Freeman is in it. Is in it. Mm-hmm. Martin Freeman is the Hobbit. The, he's yeah. the he titular. Is the Hobbit. titular yeah, Hobbit. He's yeah. the titular Hobbit. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's all I can name. Uh, when we get to the, I'm gonna be the real heel on the Lord of the Rings episodes, which well, I'm we're sure not there yet. We're I know. Not there we're not, yet. So. <laughs> yeah, we're, let's let's. <laughs> so I, I mean, save like, that fact, juice. Save it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, I can't name them, but it but feels, you're saying true though. Yeah, I'm saying true. Clint, you're also saying true. I'm going false. You, no, oh, I'm going, going false. false. Yeah, because I can't how, name how, any others. How many? How many? Are there any? Uh well, oh one, well, you know one. what? Kate Blanchett. There's Kate Blanchett also. So then we got two. Yeah. Uh, is like like Rafi Spall in some random bit of The Hobbit? I don't know. I I could see that happening. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know uh, anything. Rhetorically speaking, um, <laughs> Broadbent might have been in something. I don't know. I'm still going false. I'm gonna go false, false because it's actually more than four. Oh, okay. That's my we guess. Gotcha. I'm gonna go false and I'm gonna guess why. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Who so is as it? You guys... Kate Blanchett, Martin Freeman. Okay, so um, oh wait, uh, there's a live update from Ty. Thank you, Tayo, because he knew you <laughs> Tyo, guys were gonna. Tayo is in the Google Doc. Yes. Uh, so as you guys mentioned, Martin Freeman, titular Hobbit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kate Blanchett, Galadriel. Uh, this one's a little tricky. Bill Nighy played played Sam Ganji in the BBC radio broadcast. Yep. And, yep, yep, yep. Uh, Peter Jackson. And before you argue with us that, oh, hey, Peter, Peter Jackson, Jackson. No, he had a he cameo was, was, in The Hobbit. He gets, yeah, he gets Clint, shot. Yeah. He's on the yeah. boat. He gets shot in Return of the King. Yeah, yeah Clint, you fucking nerd. Where were you on that one? I blew it. <laughs> yeah. Not doing my job. I mean, the Bill Nighy one, I didn't even know. So. I mean, I did. <laughs> you were I mean, just I had that in the tank. You were just <laughs> sitting on it. Yeah. You just you didn't lay in that just trap let, for let, me. What what the record state? I got this one correct. Yeah. So when we do do Lord of the Rings, you're going to be like, now listen, you say you like this movie, but you weren't able to name four people from Hot Fuzz Not that fun. were in various versions of Lord of the Rings properties. Various. Yeah. If you call yourself a nerd, I frequently do. Um, good tour, guys. Torf, yeah, yeah, that was a fun tour. That's it for Torf. We, we, we have been trying to reach you for days. Yeah, well, I've been kind of busy. We need you back. The figures have gone a little squiffy in your absence, it has to be said. Come back to London. Sanford's hardly a fitting place for such an exceptional officer. Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, I kind of like it here. Okay, who's your MVP? Edgar. Yeah? Yeah. I feel like that's the choice, right? Like, I... I want to be more interesting sometimes. I want to go. Yeah. I want to go with Timothy Dalton for all the reasons I said earlier, but I already said those reasons. Um, so I think I'm going to go. With, I'm going to go co MVPs with Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, but Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, the writers, not the I would, director mm-hmm. and an actor. Like the, the they're, them in their writing hats, I think are the are the real MVPs. Just because, like we talked about, how tight like. Editing and the transitions and the, and the coverage that they got for this movie is obviously incredible. Uh, we talked a bunch about it. But all of, I think, ultimately my favorite bits of this movie um, that are only present in this movie are all those callbacks, all that really tight, uh, the tight jokes from you know, an hour 45 into this movie that only makes sense because of a thing that happened in, at the 30-minute mark. You know, uh, That kind of stuff is always so much fun. Yeah, I mean Simon Pegg's an easy number too. Also, I think he's really good as an actor in this. Like, you could put someone else no, in great. that role. Yeah, but again, like I said earlier, I really like him as, as I feel like he's usually the screw up, and I kind of like him as the as the competent one. Yeah, straight laced, but screwed up emotionally. Fumbled the bag with Kate Blanchett's eyes. <laughs> 
Real mistake. Real Big mistake. mistake. <laughs> um, are we all so we're all in agreement on that? I, I mean, I agree. Do we all just agree? I think, I think it's Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright because the, the writing on this movie is just top notch. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a stickler and say we have to. I have to pick one, so I'm gonna pick Edgar Wright. So what you're saying okay. is I can't pick the writers of this movie as opposed to just yeah. because like, two we, people wrote it together. Yeah. I so, mean, that would be so tough. Can if I, we had can a movie the, with co-directors. Can I give yeah, the MVP? That's what I'm trying to say. It's like to, can we give the MVP to a uh, uh, a role. As to the title, to the credit block? individual, yeah. <laughs> Can we, we give the Chris MVP Angel? to the scripts. I mean, Chris Angel, mind freak, Angel. who helped Simon Pegg lose weight for this movie, is the real 20, MVP. Twenty-eight pounds. I just can't get over two the stone. Specific. Yeah, that's that's. Oh. That was a really well crafted. <laughs> that was so specific. Uh, Tyle's getting bold. I love it. Um, <laughs> some uh, combination of Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're gonna. You're. We're in I'm agreement, but you're doing it under protest because you just want one person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. It's fair enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be a stick Cal, on this. Before we get to where this movie's ranked, we we got time for. I think we can sneak one more segment in. Yep. Uh, so you know, as we customarily do in this at this moment of the show, uh, where does Nicolas Cage? Wh- 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 who do we craft? Who do we cast to be Nicolas Cage in this movie? I don't know. Everyone's. So I have perfect. a very simple answer. Yeah. I wanted it's to be Skinner. Kate Blanchett's new boyfriend. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to oh, say Kate Blanchett. <laughs> so just like that's good. You're he right. Just, he just You're like right. turns around and be like, hey, that would be. And, a- because that would add just, to the to the Peter Jackson as Santa Claus yeah. Yeah. kind of cameos, like, yeah. You know, like uh, what was it? David or Daniel Craig was a stormtrooper in like The Last Jedi. Yeah, you know that kind of like yeah. he was there. That's yeah. him. You no, wouldn't hear I, him because yeah. I did not have a good answer because I think everyone is so perfect. No, that's the answer. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, and, and change that character's name to Nick. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. And just and like maybe leave yeah. the door, maybe leave the door open for the fact that Nicolas Cage started a new life as a CSI tech in London. Yeah. And now he's dating. <laughs> oh, wait, that's so Kate much Blanchett's better. Eyes. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. Yeah. That's good. I was going to say Timothy Dalton's character, but I also, I don't want to lose Timothy Dalton because I always no, approach Tim- this as like, how am struggle. I going to make this better? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a, this Tim- is a Skinner. <laughs> Skinner is the one that makes the most sense. Skinner or uh, honestly, like the, um, uh, what's his name? The, the actor. The lawyer actor. Uh, oh, like uh, Nicholas Cage would have been good in that role, I think. The guy that um, was uh, the straw dogs extra? <laughs> no. <laughs> Although no. <laughs> that was an incredible, like the, the semi professional actors that are waiting <laughs> yeah. in the wings, like he yeah. was an extra on Straw Dogs. Straw dogs. What a, what, what a <laughs> movie. They say it like three times too. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, yeah. It's it's those callbacks, and they say like the way that those callbacks work when they build them, they build the lines exactly the same way, and it, it starts immediately in that scene with with uh, you know Martin Freeman and Steve Coogan and Bill Nye, where it's like, "How's the hand?" And it's a little stiff. Like the, yeah. it, all of those, the way the phrasing stays exactly the same is, is is incredible. But Nicolas Cage, I think, could have been could have been that lawyer actor Romeo, whatever his name was. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the same thought process. That would have been, been a good though. Role. Yeah. Like he, he would be a good Skinner. I don't think he would be better than Timothy Dalton. I think the – No, it, just not the, even the a Brit- little bit. No. The Britishness of this movie is so intrinsic to mm-hmm. it that I just don't think you could replace yeah. anybody with American. But I do think it would play into the joke and be equally funny if he was just completely covered up and he just like turned to the camera and waved. No, that's perfect. That's, that's perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or you get you get just enough to recognize his voice, maybe yeah. where you can just like, oh, hey, okay. how's it going? <laughs> like, or you don't, and then you look up fun Nick facts afterwards, and you're like, oh, that was Nicholas. Yeah, Cage. and then <laughs> and then I'm like, there's no way. Like Tayo is clearly lying to me about Nicholas Cage being in this movie, um, <laughs> and that's how we get torfed. Yeah. Um, okay, no, that's that is an inspired choice, Cal. Thank you for for doing that. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's talk about where where this ranks. Did you guys have it on your list? No, even the, even though I spent Not the past on hour. Your list. No, I, I like I said, I, the so, last time I watched it was two thousand seven. So you want to know yep. want to know my rationale behind this? I re, I very much like this movie, but I think that this movie stands on the shoulders of a bunch of movies that aren't on my list. 
So it's yeah, like, I don't disagree. <laughs> like it's yeah. just like it's That's just reference. Point. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's just a really good homage or spoof, Clint, if you would like, of a ton of movies that aren't on my list. Which isn't to say that this movie yeah. is bad or anything like that. It's just it didn't make my cut. Well, I, I don't yeah. even think I think if but like I'm not upset that it's on the list. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the craft of it is worth it being on the list. Like yeah. it's, it's so well put together. Um, I, <laughs> while you were talking, I, if, if you saw my face fall a little bit, it's because I found out that this is a, this is a me and Dan joint. Oh, I had yeah. this, uh, which, you know, I hate doing that. I, this is the worst feeling I have, uh, doing this show. Um, I had it at <laughs> 71. Dan, Dan has it at uh, 57. Yes. Oh, so Dan, similar. Uh, Dan had it ranked uh, a, a scant 14 spots ahead of me. I knew it was uh, a Dan-ass movie. But this is very upsetting. I I, it's a Dan-ass movie. What a Dan-ass movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so where? So it's me at 71 and Dan at 57. Where does where does the algorithm put it? God, I can't. Did you guys have fun, Andy? No, I got. We, do. we got a guess. We got, we got, we got guess. one right here. I Look, love trying to figure out the. Envelope. I got okay. real close to understanding the algorithm last Ooh. episode, so I think I'm getting dangerously it's close. On, now. It's on two lists, and it's in the middle. So, like, I mean, what is yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's on a list. Yeah. It's gonna where, be kind of where. where I would say it's like ninety-one. Ninety-one, mm-hmm. that low? I think it's yeah, because it's only on two. It's only on two. You're you're saying the seventies, Alex? You said ninety-one. I said ninety-one. Yeah. Oh well, I can see it now. So. Wow. Yeah, you, you just you opened it up a little bit. It's the camera, so oh, congratulations, God. Alex. It's ninety two. Oh, okay, that's my second episode in a row where I was one off. Dan, yeah. I'm on to you. I'm on to yeah. you, Dan. You I got it. this. You, you got you cool. nailed my it. second in a row where I was one off. Within one, I'm a machine. This is, yeah. This is why I uh, am officially changing my strategy of guessing where this goes to waiting until Alex guesses God, and then I, picking you, one on, on either side. Yeah. You do do that. I did that once wow. before, I think. Well, yeah. do we, you did. Do we, do, do, we, we, do, we, uh, do we, we, we have a Price is Right rules, like closest without going over? We can do that. 91. We can do that. We'll, we'll offline that's about that. That's close. Yeah. That was close. That's real close. Man. That is very close. close. Out of 100 Jeez. possibilities. So 90, I mean, we feel good about this being number 92. Do we need to open the other envelope, have a conversation about no. booting this as a community? No. As long as you're okay with the fact that, yet again, you colluded with Dan... Another to get one. a to get a film on the list, I do not s- feel so passionate that I need to strike it. I'm frankly never okay with that, but I'm I'm to an upsetting I, extent. I'm starting to get used to it. Uh, that's you which know what? Is a whole it's, separate issue. You know what? Like I'm I'm gonna be real with you. I don't feel shame about me having to share the title with Dan on Robin Hood. You should. I mean, I my, mine with well, Dan was. There, yeah, there, are, there are many. Should, yeah. There are many furries yeah, no, in the comments that. that agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is the only one of us sitting pretty with like. Well, me and yep. Dan like Seven Samurai. It's like I okay, feel good about just... that one. Alex innocent. <laughs> Seven Samurai. <laughs> All right. Well, we need to have this argument in private, I think. Um, so that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you for talking about hot fuzz with with me and. Dan, I guess. Um, but uh, enjoyed the conversation. Thanks to Ty Yakin for producing the show every week. Producer Francesca Rivera is here as well. Uh, along with technical producer Marian Franzen and DP Jamie Parzal. Without you guys, we'd have zero chance at winning Village of the Year. Uh, and we'll just need to set up some kind of accident for Dan because that guy's useless. Um, so... Come back next week when we will once again be crafting a, a just a perfect double feature pairing uh, by going from Hot Fuzz to Lion. So, uh, buddy cop movie in the English countryside. Just just hop over to the continent to to deal with some some police brutality in France in the nineties. Um, I don't think I think there are fewer jokes in Lion than there are in Hot Fuzz, to be honest. Uh, so we'll find out about that next time. And uh, meanwhile, stay safe, be good, and we'll see you next week. 